And since uh, what we're going to speak about today, since this is, uh, of course, some high dimensional extenders, then it is, uh, well, is uh, expected that we should give some introduction about one dimensional expanders, namely expander graphs. So this is what we're going to talk about today. So, I think in English. Sorry, just gave a talk in Hebrew. We start from that side of the board. Okay, so we're going to speak about one dimensional expanders. Expanding expander graphs, well, it would give a definition of expander graphs using the Chigger constant and then prove that this is equivalent to another spectral definition. I would explain it and then I would show what is the optimal spectrum you could expect from an infinite family of graphs. So what is an optimal expander? So let us begin. So usually we say graph just the one dimensional complex. And you usually write G equals V E with V being the set of vertices and E being the set of edges. And we will sometimes use also the notion if, since for higher dimensional complexes we write x0 for the zero dimensional cells and the one dimensional cells we will, also, we will sometimes use this notation as well and the previous time uh, Alex defined the Chigger constant so the definition so let x be a graph the Chigger constant denoted edge of x is defined to be the minimum of e a p. This means edges from a to b over the minimum of the size of a the size of B and A and B range over all distinct uh, sets whose union is all of the vertices. Whose union, is, whose, union, whose union is all of the vertices. Okay? Ah, and of course um, we do not want to allow empty sets, otherwise this is not defined. So this is the Chigger constant, and we said that a graph is an epsilon expander if its Chigger constant is larger than epsilon. Okay, so call x is an epsilon expander. I would just use the, the abbreviation x. So one is less than a ripple, I do this. And of course, obviously, this measures connectivity. So if you just want to draw this, so if this is V, then you divide it into two sets, A and B, and then you count the number of edges in all directions. You just want a lot of edges. No matter how you partition, uh, the, the set of vertices, you, also, you always have a lot of edges. Okay, and with the graph, we have several additional objects, and let me recall them. So, uh, 
solution B adjacency matrix of X is usually denoted by A. Let's call its entries A and J, where I and J are just vertices. And Aij equals number of edges from I to J. Since we are uh, interested in non-directed graphs, A is always symmetric. A is diagonalizable with real spectrum. Um, let me denote it by lambda zero, less than or equal lambda one, etc. Less than or equal lambda n minus one. N minus 2, that's the number of N minus 1. Now, the top eigenvalue, um, well, this is what is sometimes called the Brown Frobenius. In the case of K regular graphs, a K regular graph is a graph in which every vertex uh, is adjacent to K other vertices. Okay? This is a, everyone know this definition? Do you mean at least k or at most k or this? I, I mean, when you say x is k regular, if it's no, 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 precisely k. Oh, precisely. Okay. Uh, let's get that precisely. Yes, this means k regular. We will often assume this condition. Okay. Usually, these are the most interesting graphs. The regular ones. So in the, in the case of the k-regular graph, uh, you cannot exceed k, and you cannot be uh, the, the smallest eigenvalue cannot be less than minus k. Again, this is k-regular. And some of you uh, may know that. These two eigenvalues, at least when uh, x is k-regular, well, I should mark this, so remark. When x is k-regular, um, lambda 1 and lambda n minus 2 control Ah, 
I'm sorry, yes, lambda zero. Yes. Um, just a word about it. Uh, so if you have some probability p, uh, probability vector on the vertices of uh, x, then if you perform a random walk on the graph, and this is a k-regular graph, so this is after one step, then you will get 1 over k AP. And you repeatedly apply this matrix, and you want to know how fast this converges to the uniform distribution, namely to a vector of units, if it converges at all. Well, not a vector of units, I mean um, a vector, a constant vector. Um, and it depends on the eigenvalues. Of course, the largest eigenvalue would eventually pull. Okay, so let us write P equals sigma of uh, lambda, sigma of alpha i vi, with this being an eigenvector. So if you apply, if you apply one k p, this is just sigma alpha i. Apply to repeat the say r times, and this is just alpha i and the i with r. Eigenvalue, the, the eigenvalues with the largest absolute value, they pull, eventually they dominate. So this would eventually be equivalent to lambda zero uh, to the minus r, v zero, or uh, to the minus r. Sorry, this should be lambda n minus 1 if the absolute value of lambda 0 is less than n to the minus 1, lambda n to the minus 1, and lambda n to the minus 2. So eventually this, this vector, sorry, vn to the minus 1 eventually dominates. Because these become negligible. Um, just let me write this differently. I'm sorry. This is sigma of alpha i, lambda i over k to the r i. So this is, since um, this is less than 1, uh, if less than 1 time and we get lambda n minus 1 over k to the r the i if the absolute value of lambda 0 and the absolute value of lambda n minus 2 is smaller, strictly smaller than lambda n minus 1. Now it's clear? And what is this, I'm sorry, this is Vn minus 1, what is this vector? This is just, okay, this is 1, this is k, and this is just k, k, r, and this is just a unit vector. And this is what is k, k. So this is the uniform distribution. This is k1, and this is Vn minus 1. This is uniform distribution. Any 
it's rather one over. Ah, I'm sorry, one over, over, yeah, one over, one over n, um, one over the number of vertices. Sorry. Right. So yes, this is one over n, with n being the number of vertices. It depends on how you want to normalize your vectors. Uh, what do you mean? If you want vi to be of, of length 1 here. It, well, this is a probability vector, so the sum is always 1. No, I mean, how do, how do you choose vi? Ah, I, I want them to be normalized. Uh, I usually want them to be normalized so that their L2 norm is 1. Yes, and then it should be square root of that 1 over square root. Well, usually, the, since we're talking about uh, yes, probability vectors... This, this one is more reasonable. Hmm? I think this, this is more reasonable. Yeah, the, the L1 norm. Okay, so it depends how I normalize them. But what you see eventually that the convergence to the uniform distribution is the, how fast you converge. So um, when these, as long as... Uh, when these two are smaller than lambda n minus 1, the, mo the more these two are smaller than lambda n minus 1, which is k, the, more the faster you converge to a uh, uniform distribution. OK? So this hints that this spectrum might be related to being, a, being an expander in the sense of the Chigger constant because Usually when you converge fast to the uniform distribution, it means that you have a lot of edges. You move a lot in the graph. There is a lot of movement, a lot of connectivity, I would say. So this is about uh, the uh, adjacency matrix. And there is another important operator the graph, namely the Laplacian. So the definition uh, Laplacian. functions from this set to the real numbers viewed as a vector space and, and actually viewed as a Hilbert space. Okay, this has a natural inner product just uh, multiplying uh, the values of the two functions and sum up everything. This is a Hilbert space. And we have a natural uh, map, standard map from, I'm oh, sorry, we should fix an orientation. delta 0 from C0 of x to C1 of x. So this is important that you would remember these maps because they would pop up later. And they have, they have higher dimensional analogs. Uh, this is the co-boundary map. 
and it is defined as follows. So if I have some psi in C0 of x, um, so I need to apply it on an edge, right? So this is going to be psi of E plus minus psi of E minus, where what does these symbols mean? So E is equals, this is just an unordered pair. Plus, let's without loss of generality suppose that u is less than or equal v. So e plus would be v and e minus would be u. Okay, so I just take e plus to be the larger uh, vertex and e minus to be the smaller vertex in e. That's all. And I think some people define it uh, the other way around. <laughs> I and mean, then when you, here I wrote u is less than or equal to v. Uh, but you could reverse it to get the same thing. It's like reversing the orient orientation. What confuses me is that uh, c1 is supposed to be a set of forms on edges. Meaning yeah, so I, I would, I would uh, give you a word about that later. So I actually took that definition from your paper. This one? Well, the, something like that. I think I said in your paper. And you, you, you told me you choose orientations. You need, you need to... Uh, I mean, I, I don't like the orientations uh, also, but... Uh, no, you cannot talk about functions. Is this operator... Uh, well, yeah, I mean, functional edges won't be well defined this way because it's not. Yes. Well. So the thing is, let's say we have some graph. I don't know. So, so once we, so we give an orientation to the graph. So we say one, two, yeah, it will be. three, four, and five, six, and now we give directions. Um, so this is, you go from the small to the big. So it goes like this and this. And this would be, if this is E, for instance, if this is the edge E, then this is E plus, and this is E minus. Yeah, it's even well defined. Hmm? It's even well defined. Yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, and since we are on Hilbert, since these two are Hilbert spaces, we have a dual map. Okay? We also have a dual map. From C1x to C0x, this is uh, delta star. Uh, sometimes called the boundary. <laughs> now notice that this is for finite x, so I could uh, identify this, this should be, uh, this is the cohomology, this is the homology. Uh, everything here is finite dimensional, so I can identify homology with cohomology. And I do not want to go further into this issue. We would uh, deal with it later in the course. So what is this? Uh, yeah. So what is this map? Uh, let me. Uh, I wrote it here somewhere. I always forget it. Um, uh, yes. So if you carefully compute the delta star of phi, with phi being the functions on the uh, edges, so now I need to evaluate it on the vertex. So this is just uh, sum of um, sum of f of phi, where I'm ranging over all edges with phi 
equals to plus minus uh, f e, where I'm ranging over all edges with e equals to minus. So if we go back to this example, then if I have a vertex, then I every edge that comes into the vertex, I take it with a plus, and every vert edge that emanates from the vertex, I take it with a minus. So, if I have this, if I have this, then these are taken with pluses, and these are taken with minuses. Okay? So, what is the Laplacian? <laughs> so, I defined a lot of Laplacian. So, the Laplacian. is just the composition of these two maps, delta star delta from C0x to C0x. Um, We would uh, now denote it by delta. Later, we shall see that this is in fact delta zero uh, down or minus. No, it's up. It's delta zero plus. Ah, this is plus. Because it goes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, sorry. But let us call it delta for now. So claim. Delta is independent. I never remember how to spell independent, so there might be an A somewhere. Of the ordering of V. So I did something which is not natural, namely taking an order on V, but what I eventually got. Uh, is something which is independent of the order. And let us verify it just by direct computation. So let us compute. Uh, so what is delta of psi in V? So now it begins just straightforward computation. So this is delta star delta. Um, of psi of v. Namely, this is so if I go to the definition there, then this is direct sum on all the edges, uh, sum on all the edges with v equals a plus um, delta psi of E minus all the edges E so that V is E minus delta psi of E. This in turn is sum over E, V equals E plus, and this is just phi of E plus minus phi, psi of phi minus, sorry, um, this just came in, so we are talking about the Laplacian of a graph, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> uh, and minus basically the same formula, psi of phi plus minus psi of phi minus, and Observe, what, what is here, this is just psi of v, right? Because v is equal to e plus. And this is psi of v, because v is equal to e minus, right? So this sum, I have a minus here, so I could just reverse it, 
right? And this is just sum over all vertices u such that um, u is adjacent to v psi of v minus psi of u. Why? Because just take the edge u v. So either the, this edge ha appears here, so it has v as a plus, so I get this sum, or I get this sum but negative because I have a minus here. So this is the same thing. So I, this is the formula I get. And you see that this is independent of the order. Um, by the way, if I have multiple edges, then I need to count each vertex the number of, uh, as the number of edges connecting it to V. But we usually won't have multiple edges. Okay? So let, this is an important formula. So I want to I want to write it down. So delta of psi of v is sum over vertices of v which are adjacent to v uh, of psi of v minus psi of u. Now. In case, uh, this is also equal to the degree of V. Degree meaning here the number of vertices adjacent to V. Times psi of V minus sum of u adjacent to v and u. So this is an important formula. And in case in case uh, x is k regular. Delta is just k times the identity matrix minus a, the adjacency matrix. Right? This is just the matrix of this uh, transformation is just the adjacency matrix. And here I just get the degree, which is k times the identity. So we, if you take the standard basis, uh, then you get this. Okay? Any questions about this? So Laplacian also have a spectrum. Since delta is delta star delta, small delta, delta is uh, sy uh, symmetric and positive definite. Um, this means that it has this diagonalizable. non-negative real spectrum. And let us write this spectrum. It would turn out to be of great importance. What is this spectrum? So this is zero, lambda zero, that's the original number one, etc. etc. Lambda n minus one. So why is lambda zero uh, zero? The reason is that uh, delta of units is zero, as you can easily. 
easily verify from the formula above. So I always have zero, but this guy, this uh, eigenvalue, is interesting. So the definition uh, lambda one of x is lambda one of delta. Well, I think I would just call it lambda of x. It's called the spectral gap. So this distance from the first eigenvalue to the um, zero eigenvalue, which is zero, so this value would turn out to be of great importance. And note um, when x is irregular, we do not. Uh, we could use the adjacency matrix to define. Uh, this uh, spectral gap. Lambda x is just lambda n minus 1 of the adjacency matrix minus lambda n minus 2 of the adjacency matrix. And why is this? So let me just draw a picture here. If this is spectral delta, so it looks like this. So here I have 0, and then I have I know, lambda 1, lambda 2, etc. This is spectral matrix, adjacency matrix. Since I have this, since the matrix of delta is just k times the identity minus the identity adjacency matrix, so the spectrum of A, you just make some kind of flip. K minus whatever, K minus your eigenvalue, and you get um, this is lambda n minus 2, n minus 1, which is K, and then this is lambda n minus 2, and lambda n minus 3, etc. So once you do this, uh, transformation. This is um, this matrix A is just K. This is K I minus delta. So this corresponds to this, and this corresponds to this, and this corresponds to this. So it's just reversing the spectrum. So you could use the adjacency matrix. Again, only when this is k regular. Otherwise, you need to use the Laplacian. Okay, so these are all uh, common uh, notions uh, for graphs, and the main result of today, what, what I'm planning to prove, is the following: is the Uh, it is due to several people. Uh, forgive me for not remembering all the names. I'm sure Alex could give you a full uh, reference list. Uh, the theory goes like this. Um, H Schieber constants where over 2m is less than or equal to lambda x, which is less than or equal to twice the sugar constant, where m is the maximum degree in v, which is the origin in v. Informally, what, what does it mean? Informally, it means that being a good expander is equivalent to having large spectral gap.
So this is a very nice theorem saying that so if we want to find an infinite family of epsilon expanders, then this is the same as finding an infinite family of graphs with a large spectral gap, which is, say, spectral gap which is bounded away from zero. This is what the theorem means. Yes? Is this type when the graph is big and let's say m is constant? I do not know. I, I really don't know if this is tight. I mean, it could be. Uh, well, I, in the gap here, but it's I think this is a, perhaps this is tight. Uh, this uh, this is a different so. We should say that most uh, constructions of expanders uh, are usually done uh, and you prove that you get a family of expanders you prove that you have large spectral gap namely you prove that lambda x is larger, larger than some epsilon this is what you usually, uh, one usually proves I think calculating trigger points is rather hard yes so. uh, estimate giving direct estimations of the Chigger constant. If, you if I just give you an explicit family of graphs, then estimating the Chigger constant is usually very hard. Especially if these graphs come from same number theory or something. Okay, so before proving the theorem, um, let me state the lemma. Um, so let's L to zero of V, uh, this is just functions inside L2 of V such that the sum of psi V is zero. So I'm somehow uh, killing the largest eigenvalue uh, of the adjacency matrix, if you want to think about it. I'm just killing, uh, or the zero eigenvalue of the last and I'm just killing it. Then, lambda of x is infinite uh, over sine of 0 in L to 0 p of delta f squared over f squared. Uh, this is just a useful lemma. It is uh, elementary, so the proof. Um, she says the hmm? It's a bit of the both are less more. Well, key delta. Well, no, because delta is uh, de big delta is delta star delta for small delta. So you don't get you, you do not get the square. So without loss of generality. Uh, we may check, uh, it is enough to check for uh, uh, assume that the L2 norm C is 1. I wrote F, sorry, this is psi, psi. Okay, I'm, it is enough to verify this for uh, uh, functions with absolute value with norm 1. So what is this expression? So delta psi squared. This is the this is delta psi, delta psi. So this is the inner product of L2 B. And this is if this equals psi delta star delta psi, which is psi delta psi. Um, now this is well known to be equal uh, to the, since this is diagonalizable uh, and positive definite, then um, the infinite of psi. 
sine is the lowest eigenvalue of delta Why don't they have zero? More than I have to 
Yeah, because I'm working in L2 in L2 zero, so I don't have zero. I killed the I killed the zero like uh, value. It's because of this zero. So I don't have zero. And you can see that the infimum of this expression is necessarily lambda one, which is the smallest among the lambdas. Okay. Uh, this expression. Um, let's call it a uh, star. Um, so the infimum, infimum of star must be lambda 1. So this, uh, we are using here a lot of uh, very standard functional analysis, or I would say linear algebra. Uh, this is actually a very general argument. I think uh, we would use it several times. This claim that the infimum of this kind of expression with this being a unit vector is the lowest eigenvalue of delta. When this is, is self-adjoint, this would be used several times. This is a unit vector. I think it's even have a name. It's even a theorem and it's even has a name. Really? I think so. Okay, I'm sorry. So if the so if this theory has a name, I don't. Know. But this is a anyhow. This is a dilemma, uh, and I think we could take a break now. Okay.